Shalom, Chaverim, and welcome back to our next episode of Past and Present Podcast. We are very privileged today to be joined by Lady Kestenbaum. A big, big welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Throw it in there without us introducing you too much. We've all met you before your Matsumoto ceremonies, both virtual and in person. Um, but yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do, your background in B'nai Akiva, where you grew up, and go for it. Well, first of all, hello, Chaverim v'chaverot, Bogrim of B'nai Akiva. It's really nice to be here this afternoon. It was nice to leave school, to leave work. I am the deputy head teacher at the Independent Jewish Day School, and I am also involved with Bachad and have always been involved with B'nai Akiva. I will start off by saying that I think that B'nai Akiva was the most important formulative uh, experience of my life. Um, I believe that it made me exactly who I am today, possibly wow. with a little bit of genetic help from my mum and dad. Um, but I really think B'nai Akiva forms who you are as a person, what you'd like to do, what your values are, and how you'd like to help other people. Were you involved in B'nai Akiva at a Sveva level? Were you involved in camps? Would you be able to share some memories, some roles that you had along the way? Absolutely. So when I was a little girl, I grew up in Kenton and there wasn't any B'nai Akiva in Kenton. And one day uh, we got a new rabbi, Rabbi Eddie Jackson, and he had come from South London and was amazed that we didn't have B'nai Akiva and his aim was that we should start BA in Kenton. So this must be about 19, I don't know, 70, 73, something like that. The Madrachim who took us at the, at the beginning in B'nai Akiva had not been to B'nai Akiva themselves. So it took quite a while for it to become embedded in the community. And I'd say that B'nai Akiva, certainly for my family and for many other families, once we all started going and became more involved and Madrachim came to visit from other Svivot, uh, it affected a lot of people's family lives, their Jewish life. People became more dati because of it. They became more interested in Israel, not just the kids, but I'm talking about the parents as well. Right. So after a while, B'nai Akiva became very, very strong in Kenton. Because we didn't have very many older madrachim, um, I was a madracha from when I was about 13. But wow. When I, when I, <laughs> but there wasn't anyone else. It wasn't, <laughs> I was good. And um, when I was 14, I became Rosh Viva for the first time, but not wow. the last. That would be unheard of in 2021. Correct. I'm sure you would have lots of health and safety guidance on that nowadays. But there wasn't anybody else. So basically, I was still going to my own meetings. In those days, you had meetings until you went on your gap year of your own Shevet every week. So we would take B'nai Akiva in Kenton. Then we would walk to Kinloss, which was an hour and a half, um, to go to our own meetings. And we'd have about 120 people each of our afternoon in Kinloss for each Shevet in those days. There wasn't anything else to do in life, so don't look so worried. Okay. But we absolutely loved the social of that. The madrich I remember having there was actually Danny Kirsch. He was my madrich for a year. I also had Danny Kaufman of blessed memory. Um, and sometimes when I got a bit older, when I was about seven, 16, 17, I was also a Gimel madrichah myself. So I had to be the Rosh in Kenton, three till five. Then I had to walk to Edgeware to take my B'nai Akiva group there, which was a Gimel group, included famous people such as um, Spencer Lewis, who is now the headmaster of Yavne. And then we walked Kinloss for our own meeting, which would be later in the evening. So you could say that B'nai That's Akiva really filled good. our days. Wow. We were very healthy. We did 10,000 steps every Shabbat. <laughs> um, then later on, there was something called, um, we used to have groups of Svivot together. It was called Ichuve Svivot. And Kent and Kingsborough and Wembley worked together in a little group. So if anything big was happening, we could come together, let's say inviting them all to our Shabbat Hayrugun or whatever. And uh, then later, I can't remember how much later, we had something called the London VUD. And the London VUD was a group of people, probably not dissimilar to the Anhala, but we ran everything going on in London. That was mainly Bogrim. So I didn't do that till after my gap year. 
So I went on Beneki Bahakshara for my gap year, which at that time used to be mainly on kibbutz and Semoy Yeshiva for Shlavbet. And it was absolutely fantastic. There were about 60 of us in our group, which is a very large Hakshara. We were on wow. Kibbutz Delio. That's where I learned Ivrit. And um, we, we were very idealistic. Not everyone in the Hakshara, but some of us were. So we tried to learn and work our eight, eight hour days every single day. Uh, it was fantastic. And you knew when you were coming back from your gap year, you can stop me if you, if, if you need to, to, to come in. But when you're coming back from your gap year in those days, you knew that you were going to get a tough kid in B'nai Kiva. And the guy who was running the London Vard, who was about to become the Muskir, came to visit us on Kibbutz, and his name was Johnny Kestenbaum. So <laughs> quite obviously, we had a very long chat that evening. Um, and everyone was told, we need you to be the Rosh Svifa of Kenton for me, or we need you to do this or that. And my main memory was that my friend Jonathan Waxman uh, he had got into Cambridge, but he was asked whether he could set up a Bogrim flat in Ilford. So I'm sure that a lot of your students and Khanichim are going to find this quite amazing, but he gave up his place at Cambridge and went to a London university instead so that Ilford could have lots of new Svivot set up and a house of Bogrim of three people. And that's wow. how we all got our tough Gidim. That is dedication. <laughs> well, I mean, this, I mean, I'm sure that's only part one of the Blakey of a journey. Because I mean, I'm sure you've got so much to share. If we're able to jump a little bit to 2021, as you say, you're currently assistant head teacher at the Independent. Um, so I, I think we'd be really interested to know what role Blakeyva had in bringing you to, uh, I guess, the world of Jewish education and your role at the independent. Yeah. Well, I think that learning to be a madracha, um, and particularly when you do machane and you prepare, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher, but being a madracha really taught me that it is the same tools involved. So educating children is, if you love it and it's really satisfying, it's probably one of the most important jobs in the world. So for anybody listening out there who's thinking, oh, no, I don't know what to prepare now for my group. You have to know you have an unbelievably powerful tool, even if it's just Shabbat afternoon with five children who really just want to play football. Even if you do a little bit of, of chinuch during that time, a little bit of education, you're giving them something that could change their lives forever, uh, could make them who they are. So it was obvious to me when I finished my degree that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I studied at the Hebrew University to do a Tudat Torah. And then when we returned, I taught in Israel, but when we returned to England due to my husband's job uh, to run the office of the chief rabbi for the chief rabbi to be Jonathan Sachs um, of blessed memory, um, I just knew that I wanted to teach. But at that point, I was a mummy and I had lots of children and they needed a school to go to. And we very luckily got it into the Independent Jewish Day School. And as soon as I arrived there, even though it is called the independent, meaning it's not connected to any bodies, not synagogue bodies or youth movements, it became very clear that the Hashkafa of the school was running parallel with Hashkafa of B'nai Akiva. So we teach all our Jewish studies in Ivrit. There are always shlichim in the school. The most important day of the year is your Matzmaot. Um, most of our children go on to be B'nai Akiva leaders. Um, and it was, it's just an honor to work there. I started working when my youngest was leaving the last year. And it's just an honor to be there because really, it's really just fun. Every day is fun. And we try to make the experiences there, not the same as B'nai Kiva, but very immersed in Medinat Yisrael, Torat Eretz Yisrael, and, uh, you know, featuring Am Yisrael. So Wonderful. I've carried on, really. I'm really just an overgrown madracha. Unless you couldn't tell. <laughs> so you also mentioned that you lived in Israel for a bit. Do you want to like tell us a bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, as good B'nai Akiva couple, we, uh, I went out with the Muskir that next year, following that night of being told our Tafkidim. And to make a long story short, after being a Bulgarian studying at university in London, uh, we made Aliyah. 
and we went to live in Jerusalem. And that I believed was the end of the story, to be honest, because we were very happy there. Our first two children were born there. Um, actually, our first job, that's quite a funny story, was we arrived on Aliyah and you go to America's Klita in those days, an absorption center, which is not the jolliest place to be in the whole universe. Um, I remember lots of people sitting around on the floor strumming their guitars, um, but I just thought, what on earth am I doing here? And we didn't have any jobs. We didn't know what we were going to do. And that evening, our ex Shaliyah of Nakiva called and he said, um, Tomorrow we've got the Southern Hemisphere Torani part starting. Jonathan, we'd like you to be the Rosh of the seminar and Deborah, you're going to be the Madracha. Okay, can you start? Yeah, tomorrow morning, see you at eight o'clock. I have two questions on that. Number one was, was that just meant to be? It was Bichette. Number two, if we hadn't said yes, who would have done seminar Torani the next morning? Well, that's a different issue altogether. Anyway, so our first job was with B'nai Akiva, and my husband was very involved with Chinuch, and as I said, I was doing Tudat Torah, teacher's training in Hebrew. And we really, I imagine, could still have been sitting in Israel were it not for an amazing guy came to visit Jonathan um, and ask him to run his office, and his name was uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and the rest is history. Just as we are speaking about Rabbi Sachs anyway, I think it'd be great if you would be able to share maybe a, mem a few memories or some uh, comments about uh, your family relationship with Rabbi Sachs uh, of blessed memory. I think our Chavir would really appreciate some thoughts on that. Mm. Well, I expect most of you Chavirim uh, know Rabbi Sachs as Lord Rabbi Sachs and of course, Chief Rabbi Sachs. But when we first arrived, he was his first day of his job. And my husband always tells me that the best thing about working with him is that with all the troubles that would arrive those days, not by email, but in the post box, um, and with all the situations they had to deal with, which were numerous, the most important to, thing to Rabbi Sachs was he would say to Jonathan, you know what, let's just take five minutes and learn. He said, where else could I have worked where the person would stop what we had to do urgently at the beginning of the day at eight o'clock in the morning and say, come on, let's just sit down and learn together. And I think that how Jonathan looks back on it is what a zuchut it was as a very young man, because he was very young then, um, to be in his presence and learn with him every day and also watch him uh, develop and become the person that he would late, later be. And for us in the family, my children just thought, you know, Rabbi Sachs was often popping in and often having meetings and was just someone they were very familiar with, even when they were very, very small. So uh, it was just a great loss to all of us personally. I know it's a great loss to everyone. And if you listen to anyone giving a Devatara anywhere in the world that I've done recently, even at, at a Simchat Bat I was on from New York the other day of a cousin, and Everyone is quoting Rabbi Sachs, Chief Rabbi Sachs. It's quite unbelievable. So it was an amazing, amazing, amazing five years. Wow, well, yeah, I mean, his legacy lives on and we all miss him. Um, if I can just jump back to your role today, um, you mentioned how, you know, you vo volunteer with Bachad and just wanted to, if you could please share with our viewers a bit about what Baha does and what specifically you do, because um, not everyone is so familiar with it. Well, I don't really do very much, you know. I was the chairman of Baha, but I'm not anymore. You have a wonderful chairman, Bradley, so I'm actually a bit of an honorary president. But the truth is that uh, when I was young, I couldn't go to Mahane because my parents couldn't afford to send me because I was the oldest. Remember, B'nai Kiva was new in Kenton. All my siblings, may I say, did go to all the Machanot. As things sort of became more obvious that that's what my parents would try and find the money for. So the reason I really joined Bachad was because I didn't want any child to be in that position who should be in B'nai Kiva and should be able to go to camp. So I felt that fundraising was really, really important. Um, I think I made up for it later because started working three times a week and managed to start at Israel Machane. It was my first camp. And then I was a Madrachan camp many, many times. So don't worry, mum and dad, if you see this, I'm not upset that I didn't go to Aleph Machane. I was just giving a reason to being involved with Bachad. Um, 
<laughs> my parents were the ones who were dancing on the Omaz Zikaron Zoom, right, by yeah. the way. Yeah, so, you know. Oh, um, so that was the first reason. And also, I think there is something quite good, you know, obviously most of my Shevet live in Israel, but I think there is quite something quite good to have someone who was in BA themselves who can be a critical friend to you guys who are running BA and, you know, take any questions. Obviously it's very different times and things are very different, but I, I just thought I wanted to be able to give back because B'nai Akiva had given me so much and really made me who I am. It's amazing That's how you can take that, you know, situation that as a child was very difficult for you, but turn that into a really positive thing that's like helping so many others and um, can't thank you enough for that. Um, so would you say Bachad is purely fundraising or is there more that you guys do? No, Bachad is supposed to really be the adult voice um, supporting B'nai Akiva. So that I don't know what people say nowadays, but in my day, people, the parents used to say typical B'nai Akiva. When anything went wrong, even though it wasn't anybody's fault, it would say typical youth movement. So I think now you've got a few more adults who are possibly, it's such a big movement now with so much money going through that, through people's hands. Um, remember when my husband was the Muskia, so he was probably 22 years old. There were, there was a Bachad run by Arie Handler, but it was very much them and us. You know, we thought Bachad, who are they? These old guys telling us what to do, how could they? And I hope that nowadays it's much more, um, we just support you if you need something, especially financially or any legal issues or any, any, any troubles, then go and talk to the people of Bachad. But it's not me, so I shouldn't be taking the credit here for doing this work because I'm not doing historically, it. Historically, historically, absolutely. You should take credit. <laughs> Emeritus president you yeah. used the word honorary yeah i would like to mention harry clark actually at this point who was running bachad for absolutely years now lives in israel and he was really the person who wrote me in and said you know what if you've been if you've got so much from ba deborah stop messing around get back on bachad and and wow. do something and he was right so i have a follow-up question in response to this yeah. which is as you expressed um, part of being on Bachad is giving back in an adult form. And often when you have a Chavarim who co -op, go through the B'nai Kiva system, if you will, it's Madrich, Madricha, maybe on a camp, maybe, maybe even Israel Machana, maybe Hachshara, maybe Mazkara. But often, I would say 99% of the time, I, I don't know many of the Masquerit members in the future who end up taking a role in Bachad. So what are your thoughts on the idea of Chaverim seeing Bachad as something part of the B'nai Akiva journey, or should it be something separate? I, th I still think it should be separate because if you want to come up with some crazy new idea and send your children trekking across the mountains of northern Italy. I don't I think Bachad should be saying, why on earth would you want to do that when they could go to a field in Devon? I think it's a youth movement run by youth for youth. And I think you need to be a little bit revolutionary, a bit reactionary. Um, that's just how I see it. Doesn't mean I don't think people should help. And I think that everybody out there listening, all adults should be willing to donate some money to help an air kiva uh, particularly after covid when it's been so difficult not having various camps and all that sort of thing to keep going um, no i think it should be you guys so if you've got any ideas of how to get more kids involved get more bogrim to stay involved that has to come from you i mean i wouldn't understand this world i'm an old lady Overgrown madracha. That was your word. <laughs> That's um, only when I'm teaching. <laughs> if you want to share a bit about um, what it's been like for you to be part of the Yomatsma arrangements and celebrations and, and to be presenting that on the day. I think Yomatsma, I think you know in our community, it's probably the highlight of the year. Um, I think along with Neila, it's certainly my second or most favorite fila. I know they're very, very different. 
but there's something about the tefillah and Yom Atzmut that can keep you going for a whole year. It's the ruach, everybody singing together, the feeling of unity, seeing all the honored guests, the parents, the kids, the grandparents, um, even singing Yad Achim at the end, I find unbelievably moving. So uh, I'm about to reveal on this podcast that there has never been a year where I have not cried at some point during that tefillah. It's just absolutely fantastic. There's, there's no words for it. I loved it online for the last two years, but I, and I'm glad to see people from so many other countries, especially Israel, joining in. Because they say even though they live in Israel, they still miss this tefillah, some old bianics. Um but I did miss being in the shul, I have to admit. There's, there's just nothing, nothing like it. Preparing it for it always is great. The muskier of the last two years have been really lucky. They don't have me making them say their speech six times in a row just beforehand with me listening from the back row of the ladies gallery. And um, yeah, we've always, it's, it's always been great. The rabbi in the shul's always been so supportive. Rabbi Mervis, now Rabbi Lawrence. Fantastic, it's a great, it's a great thing. It's an amazing place to be, I have to say as well. It's really fantastic. And please God, next year we'll all be back in person. That's the hope. Um, so just jumping back to um, Jewish education, I was wondering if you could tell us from your opinion, what you think are the, the main challenges in Jewish education today? Well, I teach younger children at school, so we're luckier. I think it's easier. If you can make them love what they're doing, love their Jewish life, then they're going to be very involved with it. So I obviously do it from my old madracha perspective, which is if you're doing halal in school and you can't start dancing around the room, it's not going to be interesting. So um, that's what I mean about the independence, sometimes feeling a little bit like the Nair Kiva camp. Um, but I think as kids get older, you have far bigger challenges. Remember when we went to B'nai Akiva, there were no alternatives of what we could do. You know, we had a couple of channels on television. It's not 1880, by the way, but we didn't have the internet. We didn't have email. We didn't have social media. So I think you have to use social media to the best of your abilities, which is why I guess you're making podcasts. Um, to help with the education of people. And you've had a whole year and a half of COVID as well, where you've seen that without social media, I'm sure Benair Kiva would really have struggled to get around a message. I don't know how you do that. So I'm not the best person here to ask. Um, I'm afraid I was old school pieces of paper and um, you know, handing out what tochnit you should be doing this week in your sviva in a little booklet, which we delivered to every, every Rosh sviva. Um, but I still think that the tenets of Jewish education are the same. You have to give people something to aim towards. You have to express to them the importance of giving as well as taking for themselves, of, of giving to, to their tenua, and then helping, helping the rest of the community. And also a bit of tikkun olam. Um, I think B'nai Kiva and all youth movements should be leading the way in, in tikkun olam, be it ecology or looking at the world. We never worried about any of those things because to be honest, we didn't know about them. But now I think they're really important and I think they fit in with Jewish values. But of course, learning always comes first. Learning and fun. I think we have time for one final question. Mm. I'm going to leave it deliberately really broad. <laughs> and the question is, as someone who has been, a, if I may say so, a real servant to the Anglo-Jewish community, B'nai Kiva, etc. You can shake your head, but we think so. Um, what are your hopes for the next generation of B.A. UK Chaveirim? Um, I'm afraid I think I'm going to give you all the challenges to do. I think that you need to stay very true to religious Zionism, uh, either by living in Israel or if not being involved uh, in the UK. We have Mizrahi now. We have plenty of other places to, to teach. Um, I think that you need to, in a hard time, support Israel, but be realistic, without getting into politics, about the situation in Israel. 
by the way, back in my day, I don't know if this is still true, but when we went to Vedat Olami, they all started singing that we were the left wing B'nai Kiva of the world. We didn't really think of ourselves in that way, but apparently we had more liberal views on, uh, on things to do with Israel. And your students must be having a pretty hard time now in university. So what I wish upon them is to have uh, the discussions, not the arguments, but the discussions and the, the knowledge that they can put forward a case for Israel, but without getting into any terrible difficulties and any kind of aggression, which I think is really hard. I would also wish upon you that you would have hundreds more people who stay involved with B'nai Kiva to a later date than when they're younger children. Um, I think you've got a lot of competition from everything going on in the world. But, uh, and I know we didn't have, but when you think about it, you've got your teenagers who need things to do with them, Kiva. It's okay, this is just a druk varosh that I have. But they're going off to do other things, I think on Shabbat afternoon, when, if they're not madrachim. And I wish there was something they could do within B'nai Kiva to keep them in that hashkafar and that auspices. I, I can't give you the answer of what. I realize they're not going to go and sit and play fruit basket all afternoon like we probably did. But um, I'm, I'm sure you can think of some good ideas. So those are my wishes for BA. And also not to turn away from the old things. There's nothing better than seeing a photo of all of you in a field with possibly a bit of electricity, but no mobile phones and, it's just wonderful to see people just seeing around bonfires, singing songs like in the olden days. I think it's fantastic. So I really just want to finish saying thank you to all the people who volunteer to work for B'nai Kiva. You're doing great work. You're doing God's work. You are able to inspire a whole new generation of people without even knowing it, even if you are only playing shuffle bottom or even if you are just standing on a chair singing a song you are shaping who those people become. I know because I became that person. Wow, thank you so much for joining us today and also for all your incredible insights and everything that you've contributed to the Nekiva and wider Jewish society. We really can't thank you enough. Thank you. Um, and if anyone was inspired and would like to help us out with our Yada Fim campaign, you can go to vauk.org slash Bachard and make a lovely donation for us today um, but the purpose of this was just to have a conversation with you so thank you so much for joining us it was such an honor pleasure